Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And we apologize for the problem with the link to the session. I do see we have quite a lot of people with us and there are some just joining, uh, but we appreciate you took time on this very snowy October day. Um, I purposely sitting, I'm purposely sitting in front of a window so you can see the snow behind me, but I can't say I'm really enjoying it at this point. I'm Jennifer Klein and I'm the head of wealth management at Cambridge Trust. And it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you today, um, along with some of my colleagues from Cambridge Trust, as well as uh, our friends from Skinner. Um, I want to remind you that the audio portion of this presentation is being recorded and we will post it on our website uh, within a couple of days. I'm first going to introduce our panelists and then uh, we will have a discussion with uh, Karen Keenan Robin Starr about the current market for antiques and fine art. They have some wonderful things to share with you. Um, and then we'll be asking some questions of our panelists uh, to give you a sense of uh, the various issues that you might think about uh, if you do have uh, artwork or antiques. So let me do some introductions uh, first. And, and this is, Karen is on the top left of my screen. I'd like to introduce Karen Keene, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Skinner Inc. Skinner is one of the world's leading auction houses and the largest in New England. Karen has a lifelong passion for art, antiques, and the study of material culture. You can see the beautiful rugs that she has behind her, which I am admiring. Karen's also a formidable presence at the auction podium and became the company's first female auctioneer early in her career. Karen holds a master's degree in art history from Boston University. I always like to give uh, an interesting tidbit about people. So what I'd like to share uh, about Karen, um, she's an incredibly dedicated mom and that means different things to different people. Um, so in Karen's case, uh, back in the early 2000s, Karen actually wandered onto the wrestling mat uh, during a meet uh, between Lincoln Sudbury and Natick high schools. Um, as a worried mom, she wanted to ensure her wrestler son, Kobe, was okay. He evidently has never forgiven her. Um, no word as to whether she actually participated in the wrestling match or not. So we'll, we'll uh, leave that uh, between you and Kobe. Thank you for joining us. Um, Second, I'd like to introduce Robin Starr, who is the Director of American and European Works of Art at Skinner. She conducts numerous benefit appraisal days, lectures, benefit auctions, and she's lectured in art history at various colleges in New England. Karen attended Bates College, where she majored in both art history and physics. I actually have a daughter who went to Bates, and she told me that the double major um, in art history and physics is actually not that unusual. Um, Robin's, so the, the fun fact about Robin, her pets are all orange and they're all named after former Red Sox players. I have to say, I'm feeling just a little bitter these days. So uh, my big question is, do you have one named Mookie at this point? I do, I do okay. we have a, a Sato dog. And her name right. is Mookie. All right. But so we still love Mookie. <laughs> good, good. Uh, we won't hold it against the, the dog. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to introduce now my colleague, David Strawn. Um, he's uh, in, well, it's obvious since he's the man in the picture. David has been at Cambridge Trust for 25 years and he serves as a trusted advisor to clients and families and oversees Cambridge Trust relationship management team. David received a BA from St. Lawrence University. And he's been doing a little work in history. And I know, David, you are a history lover and recently discovered that he truly has deep roots in the United States, going back to the Mayflower where his distant relatives, John and Elizabeth Tilly Howland, Howland uh, came over on the Mayflower. And by the way, had 10 children. Um, so sounds like there's a, a large family out there. And last but not least, I'll introduce my colleague, Laura McGregor. 
Laura is a senior vice president and senior relationship manager at Cambridge Trust. She's worked with clients for over 30 years and has been with Cambridge Trust uh, since 1992. She's a member of the Boston Estate Planning Council and a, a trustee of the Linwood Cemetery in Haverhill, Mass. According to family folklore, Laura is quite the competitive cornhole player and takes great pleasure in beating the younger and more athletic uh, people in her family. So um, we'll have to, maybe when we can be back in the office, maybe we'll try and uh, have a cornhole tournament. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to turn it over to Karen and Robin who will take us through a bit of a mini antiques roadshow uh, presentation. And I know they have some beautiful things to share with us. Um, so take it away, Karen and Robin. So much, Jennifer, uh, for having us here today. Uh, Robin and I are filming from our Marlboro, uh, Massachusetts facility, and you can see behind me there's a uh, complement of Oriental rugs. Uh, Skinner just uh, ended its uh, biannual Oriental rug sale last night, which uh, fetched uh, close to three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, so these are items behind me that have already been sold, but we were so pleased with the backdrop, we decided uh, to use it. Uh, we have about 70 uh, auctions a year at Skinner. Uh, we have been around here in New England uh, for uh, over 60 years, and we are working with uh, institutions uh, like uh, Cambridge Trust and Trust in Estates, uh, law firms, any uh, estate uh, settlement uh, professionals, and also individuals uh, really all over the country. Uh, we have uh, sold uh, antiques and fine art from uh, every state in the United States and sent it off to every state in the United States and also 57 foreign countries. Um, this is the rug sale, uh, but we have 14 uh, different specialty departments. So I think uh, you might see on your screen uh, an image of the various uh, departments that we uh, we have. Uh, uh, so there are there's jewelry, Asian art, uh, Americana. Can, can you see that? Because I can't see it um, on my screen here. Um, uh, there's musical instruments. Um, there is uh, coins. Uh, we have a robust uh, wine uh, and whiskey department. Uh, a book sale will be coming up soon. So it is a way for us to really handle the tangibles as uh, we coldly say in this antiques business. Uh, yes, it, it's material culture. It tells us about who we are as a people, the kinds of things that we collected, the kinds of things that we manufactured in this country. Uh, uh, and and it there, as I always say that if, if you don't know where you've been, you're, you're not gonna know where you're going as a culture. Uh, so. But that being said, this is a market like all markets, it rises and falls and it has vagaries. And uh, so we're gonna explore a little bit about the what's hot, what's not. So next slide, um, which is a fantastic uh, image of a Van Cleef and Arpel a platinum and diamond necklace. And uh, as you can see, this piece uh, hammered in one of our recent jewelry sales for $112,500. Um, why is it important? Why is it hot? It is uh, a French designed uh, jewelry signed uh, by the very important house of Van Cleef and Arpel. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel designed jewelry for uh, kings and queens. They, they designed for uh, Queen Nasli of Egypt in the 1930s for her uh, coronation crown. And uh, it, it's just a sought after brand. Uh, and with the age of the internet, it's so fascinating because uh, signed jewelry has exploded in the marketplace. And we'll see an, another piece um, up, up next, which uh, we, can, we can take a look at. The next slide, please which is a very important Cartier. So you know these French brands, uh, as I uh, started to, to explain, the internet has allowed people to uh, keyword search. So anything signed really 
uh, is, is really exploded in terms of value. Um, obviously, we all know Cartier. There's uh, hundreds of stores worldwide by the Cartier brand. It began, as did Van Cleef and Orpel in the 19th century and uh, was family owned. Uh, this Cartier was family owned up until the 60s, which it's, it's now, uh, you know, part of a uh, a multinational conglomerate uh, with, with as, as I mentioned, you know, hundreds of uh, branches worldwide. But this particular ring uh, was important. Uh, you can see the design from the 1950s. You can see on your screen, the design is really quite sober um, and it's, it's a uh, low key. Um, and it, this, the value of this ring had to do with the two sapphires. So Cartier was known for searching uh, for the finest gemstones in the world at the time. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are jewelers uh, that from, from these major jewelry uh, outlets uh, all through the 20th century. Tiffany was another, uh, which traveled uh, to Europe and were buying crown jewels. Uh, so, so the gemstones themselves, uh, you know, for instance, after the French Revolution, uh, the, the country of France sold off crown jewels and you could actually buy these gemstones at auction. And so the, the uh, quality of them is just totally top notch. And I'm told by our jewelry specialist, Skinner has a full complement of jewelry specialists uh, on staff that the, the driver of the value of the ring had uh, most to do with the quality of, of these sapphires. Um, uh, so, uh, so it's just, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I will, as I, as I mentioned, the, the internet allows us to search for keywords. Uh, so it also, it, as it drives the price of those keywords, there's also a lot of material that is unsigned. And so I, I invite you to, to hunt through our jewelry auctions because there's a lot of spectacularly designed jewelry that is uh, just beautiful. And that jewelry actually has a little softening in the market as opposed to uh, the signed pieces. So let's look at the next slide, um, which is uh, just a tiny little Indian head uh, penny. It's in this, um, case, which Skinner uh, sent it out to have it graded, but, but it's kind of a fun backstory. And it gives uh, you a sense of what's lurking out there in New England. We find it all the time. And uh, this penny came out of a box that was uh, squirreled away for decades in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was in the back of a closet. And uh, a woman's father had been a collector of coins, and she was not. But understood that it was something of importance to him. Uh, and when she was trying to lighten the, you know, her, her load and, and clean out things that she hadn't really paid attention to in, in many years, this box of coins uh, came out of which she uh, brought, brought the box to Skinner and our coin specialist, uh, Kyle Johnson, went through the coins and discovered this uh, Indian head sent from 1877. And you know, there, Collecting coins is a wonderfully nerdy experience. And Kyle had given me reams of notes on why this one cent is worth $16,000, over $16,000. And, you know, it has to do with uh, when it was minted. Uh, 1877 was a key date for this series of Indian heads. Um, and the fact that the coin was in extraordinary condition. So it really was, was a find uh, hiding in Cambridge for all those years. So we encourage you to invite us, uh, invite us in and hopefully we can, or bring things to us, hopefully we can um, <clears throat> discover uh, something for you too. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to share with you the watch area. Uh, remember, we're talking about keyword searches and watches. I like to think of watches as uh, the gentleman's jewelry. You know, women have all the fun in our jewelry auctions. Uh, women actually these days buy jewelry for themselves, um, and you know, men sort of get left out a little bit of the of the interaction. But the explosion in the value of watches uh, has really uh, caught the marketplace. And uh, it's, it's, again, something, this is obviously a Rolex. Uh, this is an important, it, it's a, again, a, a top 
known brand. Uh, there was an auction in 2017. Paul Newman owned one of these watches and uh, he used it, you know, as you know, he was a race car driver. Um, he used it um, in his racing. When he sold his watch, it brought $17 million. Uh, so so we, we can't stress enough the importance of provenance. Who owns something is very important. And obviously Paul Newman is a household uh, name, uh, but, but there is also importance in provenance with various collectors and collections. And so we like to bring these kinds of things to market. We have a, a local group of outsider art that will be coming up in January from Beverly Burnson, who is a, a Newton native and really uh, important here in the art scene in Boston. So we'll be handling her things and talking about her as a collector and what her taste was. Um, this, uh, this watch though, I, as I mentioned, Paul Newman was a race car driver. The owner of this watch was also, and uh, he uh, used it in the seventies, bought it new in the seventies, put it in his drawer after he was done with it. And so it was really in pristine condition, hence this important uh, price on it. Um, so I, I get at Skinner to really handle a lot of the, uh, uh, what I would call furniture, decorations, the collectibles. Uh, but I wanted to turn it over to Robin Starr now, who is our fine art uh, specialist at Skinner, along with her staff, who handle uh, really an extraordinary collection of paintings and um, sculpture and prints every year at Skinner. And they are, they are the true art historians at Skinner. So Robin, but Great, so um, thank you all for being here. If I could have the next slide. Uh, and I am coming to you from our research library uh, in Marlborough. Uh, so yes, I've actually read a lot of these books, maybe not all, uh, but uh, the, the art field is an interesting field. It's very changeable. Uh, you know, when you're talking about jewelry as Karen was speaking of, part of the value is just in the materials. Uh, Cashmere sapphires bring lots of money, whether they are beautifully mounted by Cartier or not. Uh, art is a little bit more based on uh, how it moves the soul and how current tastes are going. Uh, so something like this, which at least one person in our audience referred to as a potato in a basket, uh, is actually uh, our first trender. There is a huge market right now for works by women artists and artists of color. And, this is not just due to the current political climate. Uh, these artists have been undervalued literally for decades. And people are suddenly realizing that some of these artists should be collected. Ruth Asawa, uh, as you see here, she, she actually learned her technique when she was traveling in Mexico as a student and was watching women weave metal baskets for carrying eggs and other things. Uh, but she takes it to a very new level in these sort of abstract expressionist amorphous sort of figures. This is a fairly small example. Um, and what's interesting about her is when she first came to art was when she was interred in one of the camps for Japanese Americans during World War II. And there she was fascinated with art and she was interred with a number of Disney illustrators who were also Japanese. And what else was there to do in the camp? So they were thrilled to have art students and Ruth was a very dedicated student. And that's actually how she got her start. Um, but artists of all manner are doing very well, uh, female artists, artists of color. And artists don't always have to be famous. Next slide, please. If you took Art History 101, uh, you probably didn't hear of Ruth Asawa, you probably didn't hear about Alphonse Valda as well, uh, but works by lesser known artists can still bring tremendous amounts of money. Uh, the works that do best uh, by maybe secondary and tertiary artists are works that epitomize the height of the artist's style. Uh, Valda was known for scenes uh, in the Austrian uh, and Swiss Alps, uh, such as what you're seeing here. Uh, and and they have a very modernist view, as you can see from the sort of almost mechanical forms of the figures as they ski, uh, sort of do a cross country style ski through the, the wilderness. Uh, this picture is also interesting because of its backstory. Uh, and backstory uh, always helps. This work was very fresh to the market. In fact, it was commissioned uh, by the father of the person who sold it. 
It was commissioned just before World War II began. Uh, and the gentleman who commissioned it from Valda was, uh, the family used to always go on ski trips together. And so he sought out Valda who was famous for these ski scenes. The works painted, uh, but unfortunately the patron had to flee Austria and came to the States before the work was done. So after the war, a friend who had stayed behind in Austria was able to get a hold of the artist and ultimately get the work shipped to the patron here in the States. Uh, and this little picture, it's about 12 by, it's about 12 by 20, uh, brought uh, over half a million dollars, even though it's an artist you've never heard of. Next slide, please. Now, Hans Hoffman is somebody you probably have heard of. Hans Hoffman uh, was an incredibly important teacher during the abstract expressionist period, both in New York and in Provincetown. Uh, he was also integral to disseminating abstract expressionism to Europe. Most of the artists who were working on abstract expressionism, especially in New York, tended to stay in New York. Hans Hoffman was one of these artists that tend to, tended to uh, sort, of, sort of teach abstract expressionism and actually brought it to Europe as well. So he is possibly one of the most influential artists from the Abex period just because he disseminated so much of the, the art, the technique, uh, and the co concepts behind it. This picture is interesting because it is actually, although it's titled Image in Blue, it's actually one of his rare self-portraits. Now, He's an abstract expressionist. So obviously this is not exactly a, a realistic portrait, nor should it be. Uh, but what makes this picture interesting is it's a rarity. Uh, so one of the things we do at Skinner is we have to consider what sort of a collector is going to want something like this Hans Hoffman. A collector for the Valda is going to be looking at probably a broader collection uh, where they are looking for those quintessential examples by a range of artists. Something like this, we're going to mark it very differently uh, because this is not necessarily the first thing you think of for Hans Hoffman. This is not going to be the, this is not going to be going to somebody who says, I want one great Hans Hoffman. This is going to go to somebody, whether it's a collector or an institution, uh, that wants to show the range of one particular artist. Uh, so this is something that we're going to market very differently. We're going to market this maybe to an institution. We're going to market this to people who we know have a particular interest, not so much in abstract expressionism, uh, but particularly in Hans Hoffman. Next slide, please. Now, I'm sure you've all also heard of Roy Lichtenstein. He was very well known in his day. Uh, he was part of the pop art movement, which is what came sort of as a reaction to abstract expressionism. Uh, obviously, this is very representational and you probably recognize the, the sort of the visual vocabulary. If this reminds you of comic books, it should. That's what Roy Lichtenstein was looking at uh, to make his images. Uh, so he was known for these sort of comic book images uh, right down to the use of Ben Day dots, those little sort of a dot matrix of colors that you saw in, if you look closely at a comic book, even today, you will see those Ben Day dots. Now this particular example is a triptych. The whole thing together is uh, about four feet wide. Uh, and it's the quintessential example of a print made by Lichtenstein. So why is it only worth about $500? That's the kind of expertise that we're bringing to looking at these objects, appraising them and knowing how to sell them. This particular print is a great looking print, but it was actually created after a work at the Stockholm Museum and it's in an open edition. The edition so far that's been published is over 32,000 impressions. So while it looks like a quintessential example, there are so many of them out there, it's not special, it's not rare. Uh, but happily, we know what is rare. Next slide, please. This is also a print by Roy Lichtenstein and you can see this brought uh, over $53,000 just recently. Now, this is also related to a museum. This was the Tel Aviv Museum print uh, from 1989. Once again, a similar visual vocabulary. Here he's sort of taking that comic book style and melding it with cubism, uh, but we're seeing a similar palette. When you look at it up close, you see the Bende dots, just as you did before. This was also created to raise funds for a museum. The difference is this was created in an edition of just 60. So instead of addition of 32,000, it's just 60. So that's the difference in, in the price. So you make it a rare addition and suddenly we've added 
two decimal points to the value of the object. And that's the sort of expertise that we like to bring uh, to fine art here at Skinner, but we show a much broader range. Um, Karen, I'd love to hand it back to you to sort of give a sense of, of some other sort of sneaky examples of things that might be found in the home that might not be expected to have value. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, uh, a, a quick little uh, assemblage of uh, unusual objects that we uh, have handled. Obviously, up in the uh, upper left is the Kazakh rug. Um, this rug um, is uh, a pin described as a pinwheel Kazakh at, at $18,000 was it was its hammer. Uh, a Parcheesi board, uh, again, at the $17,000 range. These uh, works of art are 19th century. The folk art, Americana folk art is uh, abundant here in New England and it is extremely collectible in many parts uh, of the country. Um, uh, I, wonderful. The next uh, little image of that Marblehead vase, uh, which has got a great uh, backstory to it, uh, bought in a yard sale. Uh, for very little money, uh, under $100, uh, which sold for $303,000 uh, at Skinner. Uh, and I, I love the, the um, so, so on the weekend, hit those, hit those yard sales and then <laughs> come to us after. Well, uh, 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 there, there's a wonderful uh, em carved emerald uh, which uh, is probably Indian mogul, uh, which again, we talked about Cartier uh, buying uh, gemstones, important gemstones. Uh, this kind of thing would have been sold out of uh, India in uh, the 18th and 19th century and, and saved. And then an important jeweler like Cartier would have reset it. This is in an Art Deco uh, form. And then uh, finally, uh, George Nakashima, which is... Uh, the mid-century modern, as you've all heard of, has really exploded onto the marketplace. Uh, and uh, these two chairs uh, fetched the, together the pair just under $30,000. Um, so let's, let's look at the next slide, uh, which, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about brown furniture uh, and how nobody wants it any longer. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, this, this is actually my wheelhouse. My specialty really is Americana in 18th century. It's what, it's what I do uh, on the roadshow. Mostly um, I'm, I'm appraising furniture. So when this little piece came in, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, we feel a little um, uh, sad that the marketplace for brown furniture is softened. Uh, we estimated this at seven to $9,000. Um, and the, the hammer was $137,000 over, over that, as you can see, uh, this just recently sold during the summer. And uh, why did it explode in value like that? Uh, because of its wonderfully figured top. Um, if you can see, it's got an unusual top. Uh, and then, it, it, you know, it's so bright and perky sitting up on those uh, four bandy legs with a little fan carving, you know, in two places. Uh, so, and we, we, it had a lot of provenance to it. Um, and the family had collected it uh, during the 1970s and really done, uh, kept it in, in their home. And so waited, waited for a time when they were downsizing. Uh, so it, it was really, really, we were so pleased that not, not all brown furniture is alike. Um, next slide. And this is a, a funny story that, uh, uh, brings eBay into the conversation. Um, in Seattle, Washington, apparently there is a, uh, a Goodwill or Salvation Army that regularly loads um, their donations onto eBay, hoping for a, a, a marketplace that will be broader uh, than they can achieve in their Seattle store. Uh, and so this piece was bought uh, on eBay uh, I think in the $850 range by a collector. It's only about uh, 14 inches high, uh, but the carving on it was exquisite. It was just beautiful with original paint. So we, we imagined it to be, I mean, we're not totally sure uh, because we've never seen anything like it. We imagined it to be a perhaps salesman sample I mean, that, that phrase is bandied about a lot, but it was small enough that it could be carried uh, that would have uh, shown a, a ship's captain or shipwright what sort of 
uh, carving could be made for a ship figurehead, which of course would be uh, larger than life size. Uh, so this little piece was a great rarity, bought on eBay for $850. Photograph of it was sent to Skinner, uh, to our Americana department, because we have such a great reputation for handling Americana, achieving top uh, dollar for objects uh, that this piece ultimately fetched $21,000. Uh, uh, at a Skinner auction. We had the piece estimated at three to $5,000. Uh, so we try, as our Americana department likes to explain, if we can keep estimates at a conservative level, it gets collectors ener energized and gets them competing and then drives the price uh, for what these are worth. So uh, as a former CFO at Skinner used to say, you guys are like, pure capitalism. You guys are like, this is how it's supposed to work. It's an open market. And really the, the, uh, the, the buyers are deciding what the price is going to be. Um, next slide. Um, I, I travel all over New England and visit people in their homes. And um, it, you know, there, there are standards, which you talk to people about jewelry and silver. That's usually things that are hiding in drawers and you ask people, is there any jewelry or silver? But what you should also be doing is, um, is, is uh, just checking things out. I mean, obviously asking permission, uh, but I wanted to show on the right-hand side were two coin silver uh, spoons, but they were not just any coin silver spoons. They were in fact uh, spoons that were designed by and made by Paul Revere. Uh, around 1800. These two spoons were hiding in a kitchen drawer in Maine, in a, uh, and they had been used, just used, and no one really thought much about them. Uh, but when we went through the house and were really trying to discover all that we could to monetize the tangibles in the home, these two spoons were discovered. And so $8,400 later, um, I now have to ask people about, because of the change in the marketplace, um, about whiskey and wine. I mean, that was, you know, I've, I've been doing this close to 40 years. I've I never, uh, except for within the last uh, three or four years, I've asked people, can I look inside their liquor cabinet? I mean, that's just, <laughs> I just that's felt awkward. Like, that's awkward on a house call. <laughs> too much of an intrusion. But now I do, because we have a very robust uh, whiskey and wine uh, department at Skinner. Wine, we've you know we've been in the wine business uh, for uh, over a decade at this point. But whiskey is new, and uh, actually you can go on to the Skinner website right now, and there is a whiskey only auction. And this uh, th these spirits are collected from people all over the United States who have this wonderful stuff, and it's. It's a new collectible, and I'm, I'm guessing it's going along with the guys who are collecting watches. I don't, I don't know. I'm sure I don't want to get too sexist here, but, but uh, the, the the whiskey, it, you know, it's a fun collectible. It uh, describes uh, our history. Uh, people love the uh, prohibition bottles, uh, so it, so it, it's something that we are are, are continuing uh, to understand in terms of the market uh, marketplace. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, this is a group that actually wandered into our Marlboro uh, gallery recently, a full uh, uh, 15 uh, volumes of um, Jane Austen's uh, works of art. It's a rare set. Uh, they're, they're all first editions. And uh, this will be coming up in our, in our uh, book sale, which is up online now, with an estimate of twenty to $30,000 in trying to reach out uh, to uh, the broader uh, market. So we'll discover really what it's worth uh, after after the sale is over. Um, next slide. There's a lot a, a lot to talk about in the area of of um, Chinese and Asian art. I would say mostly in the Asian and Korean uh, areas. Um, there are uh, all over New England uh, material that people. Uh, put away, uh, you know, collected in the 18th and early 19th century. As you all know, we did uh, whaling and we did trade, China trade uh, of, out of Boston um, and you know, Nantucket, uh, Bedford uh, and, and captains uh, collected 
and brought back material. And this, uh, this piece was discovered recently uh, in a family here. It's a signed 18th century bottle vase. It, it, it's, a, it's a rarity uh, because of its shape, its decoration. Uh, and uh, this, as you can see, fetched uh, $1.2 million. Uh, and next slide. Um, it, it doesn't get better than this in terms of uh, Chinese ceramic. Uh, this is a Fenkai uh, flower and landscape vase. Uh, Qinlong is 18th century. Uh, this probably, uh, this, this was made for an emperor, we are sure. This is $24 million uh, at, at Skinner. And uh, it, it was made uh, for an emperor so that the potters and craftspeople could show off how good they were. And so you can see these panels that are uh, painted and they're showing off their glazes by the uh, Sang de Boeuf. You see that red glaze around it. There's a celadon color and a pale green and then the typical blue and white from the Ming period. Uh, the, the, um, it, it's almost like a riff in jazz. You know, the, the, the artist is showing, he's, got, he's showing all he's got to give uh, to the emperor. And uh, clearly the, the price uh, re reflected that. So I, I thank you all uh, uh, for, for uh, being with us and uh, hope for you to, ho hope to hear from you uh, someday soon. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Robin. I'm still, still uh, getting used to muting and unmuting. Um, that was fascinating and some beautiful pictures. And uh, one of our um, participants has uh, mentioned that, Asawa, that the USPS uh, has a stamp set for Ruth Asawa. So if anybody was really excited uh, by the potato in a basket, um, you, can, you can get a little bit of that uh, through, through the postal service. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting what you found in people's homes. And um, in one of my previous jobs, uh, I was responsible for helping bring in artwork and antiques that people might want to donate to Harvard University. And one of the things that uh, was donated to us was a stamp collection, which turned out to be worth $600,000. So you really do never know what might be in somebody's closet uh, that turns out to be valuable. So uh, that, was, that was really interesting to see. So now we'll turn to a few questions uh, for David and Laura and um, look forward to hearing their answers. And, and I'll start out with Laura. What really is considered to be a collectible? Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, collectibles, as you've seen, are, are many of the wonderful samples that um, Robin and Karen have shown us today. But um, some obvious examples are um, paintings and sculptures, jewelry, gemstones, and gold. Um, some other examples, uh, given market trends, uh, include um, uh, rare books, as we saw today, um, coin and stamp collections, um, antiques and artwork. And some things you might not consider, depending on market trends, um, perhaps Beanie Babies collections and um, uh, sports memorabilia. So those are lots of ideas of different kinds of collectibles, um, in addition to what we saw this morning. So those baseball cards from the Topps Bubblegum uh, may have value. Uh, it's not, not a uh, professional opinion. So um, Laura, when, when we're thinking about somebody who who has a collectible, um, should, they, should they have them appraised? And, and uh, why is an appraisal so important, whether for insurance or other purposes? So thank you, Jennifer. Absolutely, appraisals are, are very important to determine the value of your collectibles. And um, there are really three reasons usually. As Jennifer mentioned, um, for insurance purposes, you need to have proper valuations to make sure you have the proper insurance coverage for your collectibles. Um, for income purposes or income tax purposes, if you decide to sell uh, or make a gift, um, you need to know the income tax ramifications. And then 
ultimately for estate tax purposes, um, upon your death, your executor will need to have valuations for um, your estate tax return and also prior to death for planning purposes. Thank you. Um, so David, um, if somebody finds an object uh, at in their house and they they think it has potentially some financial or certainly some sentimental value, how would they go about uh, uh, either disposing of it or selling it? Sure, Jennifer, thank you. Um, there's really two ways. Uh, one is, uh, as we talked with Skinner, is to sell it. Uh, you know, we could very much, uh, as, as Laura said, get an, get an appraisal and then get, determine if that's um, what you wanna do is to sell it in the open market. Um, it, the other way of, of, uh, of disposing it is by gift. You can give it to a family member or you can give it to a charity for that matter. Uh, but in, in those cases, you really do want to know what your uh, value, what the value is by an appraisal um, and make sure that uh, the uh, gift, if, if it is by gift, that uh, you're, um, uh, you're very specific about how that gift is made. It can be done by um, uh, including it in your will. Uh, it can be by a memorandum at your death. Um, it can just be by during your lifetime by, uh, um, by actually a physical gift. So there's lots of different ways of disposing of, of artwork, but you have to make sure that uh, when you're doing it, you know what the value is and the recipient knows what the value and the basis is. Great, thank you. Um... We have a couple of questions about what's happened to the value of artwork and collectibles during the pandemic. And so I'm curious, Karen or Robin, what are your thoughts there and what are you seeing? We're seeing people are fascinated with bidding right now. I mean, let's face it, we're all stuck at home. Uh, we might be getting a little tired of our four walls. So a lot of people are, they're reevaluating uh, their homes, their collections, uh, and they've got the time to be online a little extra and do a little retail therapy. So the prices throughout the pandemic have been terrific. Uh, if anything, for the moment, things are even more vibrant than usual. People are really participating heavily, really bidding a lot. Wouldn't you say, Karen? Yes, I mean, I, I would agree. I, I, I won't lie uh, when I say that uh, March and April uh, were very worried and very nervous. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, we uh, have, at, at Skinner, have really dedicated ourselves over the years to a very robust uh, online presence. And so every single thing we sell has got an image online. Uh, you can talk to specialists about the condition of a piece. Uh, we are, you know, with di social distancing, mask wearing, uh, allowing people to come into the gallery uh, by making an appointment to see these things. And, but if you had told me that people would buy without, uh, the number of people that would compete and buy without seeing things mm -hmm. as they're as great as it is, I wouldn't have believed it, but it's happening. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the internet has just really changed our business. It, you know, I know it's a cliche at this point, but um, it's the internet, it's really, uh, the pandemic, excuse me, has really accelerated what was going on anyway. So our online presence, we're, we're grateful that we, you know, have, have invested in it. You know, we've got a new app and it just makes it so much easier uh, for people to participate. And uh, we're, we're reaping the re results of that. And I want to reiterate that, you know, at Skinner, we don't, we're not buying anything. We don't own the things that we, we sell here. Um, we enter into a partnership with uh, a seller um, and we take a commission rate for what the things fetch. So it's so important to remember that in terms of selling things outright, uh, that you really get fair, a fair uh, marketplace evaluation when, when you go to public auction. Great, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I might now turn to the most unpleasant subject of taxes. Um, um, but uh, David, how are sales of collectibles treated for income tax purposes? Thank you, Jennifer. It's really, it really determines on the, 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 the person selling, actually. Um, as our friends at Skinner have told us, I mean, they're the professionals. If you're a professional 
uh, in art or in uh, the business of collecting, um, then when you go and sell, it's part of your income for your business and therefore it's treated as ordinary income. But if you are like Laura and Jennifer and Maine, you're a regular Joe or Jane uh, person who likes to um, you know, collect art or, or it's a hobby and you go and sell, then it's treated as a capital gain. So it's really important to determine um, you know, what you're gonna be. If you're gonna be a business person and incorporate yourself, then you're creating uh, an income generating business. But if you're a hobbyist and a collector or you have something up on the wall or like a lot of, uh, a lot of the Skinner clients who uh, find things in their, in their cupboards or in their basement, uh, then, it's, uh, then it's a capital gain transaction. Right, and so how is the cost basis of a collectible determined? You know, it's very difficult in, in, in artwork uh, uh, quite often to determine the basis because things are passed on from generation to generation. But what the cost basis is, is what the value was when that uh, a piece of art or that, uh, that uh, tangible property was purchased. Not when it was gifted or received, it's when it was purchased. So if, uh, if you could determine the basis on a Ming vase from the 13th century, I give you all the best credit. But uh, most things are, uh, you know, purchased. Um, you know, there, hopefully, you have some sort of receipt or documentation. It can be very, de very difficult to determine basis. And my recommendation is, when you're trying to do that, work with work with a professional, uh, whether it's your accountant, whether it's someone at Skinner's who can help in that Provence, as they talked about. That's the way you determine basis. Great, thank you. Um... There's an interesting question, which, which I actually ran up against uh, in my Harvard days. And I, I don't know if this is in your specialty or not. So please feel free if, if it's not. Um, but what about selling ivory? Well, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go, David, do you want to take that? <laughs> I guess. I, I, was, I was sighing because I know that's a very touchy subject. I'm going to let you guys handle that one for us. <laughs> Oh, um, you no, know, it, it is, um, you know, there are uh, federal laws and there are state laws. And uh, at Skinner, we try to comply with all of them. Um, you know, the, the basis is that an object needs to be 100 years old. You also need to prove that it uh, was brought into the country um, prior to, I believe, 1982. And please don't, this is going to get filmed and you're going to hear, no, it was actually 1984, or no, it was actually 1978. But so there is a date, <laughs> which it, you have to prove that it came into the country before. Uh, most people can't do that. You know, they just don't, you know, we ask people with a uh, large carved ivory piece, uh, do you have any photographs of Thanksgiving celebration? And, you know, I think with, with the piece sitting behind you, that will, but I would say 99% of the time people have these objects and uh, they just can't reach the hurdles with, um, that they need to reach in order to sell it, which I think that's why the law was designed. Um, and so we say, sorry, we, we can't help you. So we are not in the business of selling any ivory that doesn't meet the very strict criteria for sale. Right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so in terms of uh, thinking about the cost basis uh, for if you're selling something, is there a step up of cost to market value at the time of death uh, for a collectible? Is it similar to stocks, for example? Jennifer, yes, there is. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's included in, in a person's estate, it, it does receive a step up in basis. In fact, to Laura's point about an appraisal, uh, when someone passes, uh, their tangible property should be appraised as part of their taxable estate. And then the cost basis is re, um, reset to that value as of date of death. Um, and that's really very important when you're inheriting uh, items, you know, you now have a new basis and that can be very helpful when it comes to going to uh, sell that uh, piece of property. Thanks. And then um, both, um, David and then uh, Laura. So it, David, for you, what, what is an income tax deduction uh, like when you sell or when you donate an item to charity? Well, uh, Jennifer, it's um, for many years, the, um, uh, there were limitations on the amount of 
tax deductions that you could uh, receive for giving property to charity. It was limited to 30% of the donor's adjusted gross income. But uh, many, many of our listeners may have heard about the CARES Act, which was passed earlier this year. Uh, and the CARES Act allows for uh, the increase of the um, amount that can be given, uh, the amount of the adjusted gross income that can be used uh, between 50 and 100%. So, for example, if someone has 100% of adjusted gross income, they potentially could give away up to $100,000 of uh, property value to a charity. So it's, a quite, it's quite a nice benefit in 2020. Now, I'm not sure if that's going to continue into 2021. We don't know that yet. Uh, as of right now, it is, it is the case. Um, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for donors to, uh, to accelerate their giving to charities uh, and, and, and giving those charities uh, works of art or, or other tangibles. Thanks. And then Laura, what are the tax benefits of making, making a donation to charity after death? So upon your death, um, if you give a, a gift of art or something to a charity, your estate has an unlimited charitable deduction. And the um, uh, related use rule don't apply upon death. So the um, tax benefit may be a lot larger with an unlimited deduction in your estate versus making a lifetime gift of art. Thank you. Um, for Robin or Karen, and, and this is a question somebody's asked. So again, understanding that this may not be uh, something that you uh, are aware of, um, but what about uh, very old antique clothing, an 1880s wedding dress? Any sense of, is, is there, is that a market that exists? Yeah, it, it is. There, uh, there is a collectible market in antique clothing, for sure. There's also a collectible market in, uh, as we talked about brand names. So regularly, um, Hermes scarves, for instance, again, mm -hmm. another fashion. Uh, icon out of uh, the Hermes company out of France, Paris. Uh, these these scarves can uh, bring actually close to what they cost originally, um, you know, in the hundreds of dollars uh, at, at auction. But uh, 19th century clothing, um, uh, the the um, House of Worth uh, is is sort of known as the premier French fashion uh, pe people in, in the Americas copied their designs and made them by by hand, uh, not worth knockoffs, if you will. So if you've got a, a, a worth gown, I mean, with a label in it, it's, you know, could be 20, 30, $40,000 uh, object. Um, what we see mostly in estates in New England uh, is handmade uh, silks and uh, cottons uh, that uh, really, really matters uh, on these things. Uh, and there are, you know, wonderful uh, collections and collectors and dealers. I know there's a fun um, sh uh, little show that happens out in Sturbridge for you locals. Um, and it's a kind of soft antiques and, and it's filled with, um, it's out by the Brimfield area. And it, it they there are dealers and you know, hundreds of dealers that come from all, all over the country to sell these uh, antique uh, objects, antique clothing. So yes, we sell them at Skinner, um, but condition matters and uh, just beautiful, uh, how beautiful they are and the rarity, et cetera. All of the same criteria that you would use for any other collectible. Right, right. Thank you. So um, as I'm thinking about what I have in my closet, um, I'm guessing that my mother's 1958 wedding dress is not all that valuable. So I may want to think about what, how to dispose of that more sentimental than anything else. So Jane, Jane Nylander, who was a, um, a professor of mine at BU, uh, she was uh, in, in charge of textiles at Historic New England when it was called SBNEA, Spinea. And she, she said at one lecture, I remember that um, the white wedding dress is the one object that Spinea is is asked to to take into their collection, and we have many white yeah. wedding 
not want any more. Right. Um, what we're looking for is 19th century children's clothing because we didn't have as many uh, objects, we didn't have as many articles of clothing. Uh, I mean, did you know that in the 18th century, when they do these these appraisals for probate, which they did in the 18th century, just like they do today, that clothing was one of the most expensive objects in a person's possession in their estate. Wow. So a Nylander was looking for children's 19th century clothing. It didn't last. They wore it, wore it, and wore it out. Um, right. Fun fact. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's that's really interesting. Um, so Laura, what really is the bottom line when you're considering selling a collectible? So the bottom line is that you uh, most likely will come into a cash windfall. I mean, look at all the items that we saw today and the, the values that they uh, attained. Um, so it also will lead to quite a significant uh, tax obligation. So if you're uncomfortable before you sell uh, any type of object, um, after it's appraised, um, I advise that you consult with a tax advisor and uh, put an income tax strategy in place bef before you sell it. Great advice. And uh, I've let this go just a little past 11 since we started late, um, but I think we will close here. And so I want to thank Robin and Karen, Laura and David and, and our attendees uh, for participating today. I know I learned a lot and some of those pictures were really spectacular. Um, we will uh, be posting this, as I mentioned, to our website, and we'll also send you a link uh, to the recording for those who participated. Um, obviously, I think as we all said, um, you're, you would be wise to consult your professionals, both on tax, uh, for tax purposes or for legal purposes. Um, and we'd be happy to answer questions that you might have uh, regarding the tax or financial implications uh, of uh, any collectibles you may have. So thank you again. Uh, I see it's still really snowing out there. So please everybody be safe, uh, be healthy, and we wish you a very happy Friday. Thank you again. <laughs>